welcome to another episode of Marketing and Mocktails with Manal. Cheers. I know I've been MIA. It's, uh, it's, well, it's summer. So, you know, everybody's traveling. Everybody's having a good time. I was in St. Thomas, Virgin Islands. I was in uh, Ocean City, Maryland. A lot of beach time. I am so tan right now. I am peeling everywhere. It's ridiculous. People think that Indian people don't tan. Oh, no, we tan. We just tan a lot more darker. We tan like in five minutes. We're outside and we're tan. Um, I was in, so I got to hang out with my family. I got to hang out with my husband's family, like my in-laws. Then I was in Pennsylvania for some speaking engagements. I got back and life's just been amazing. So thank you so much for always joining in, always watching, always interacting, always engaging. You make me super happy. And thank you for always being there. And just an FYI, uh, Marketing and Mocktails with Manal is now a podcast and it goes up every Monday. So if you can't watch the live show, just download it on pretty much every phone. I think we are on Spotify, iTunes, um, everything, everything that's out there, and, like Android. We are pretty much on like, I believe 17 different podcast channels. So go ahead and download it on Monday. You can recatch and recap to everything that's going on. But without any more delay, today's guest, tonight's guest, it's somebody that you probably see online. She's like a mover and a shaker. She's upcoming. She's exciting. She is gorgeous and glamorous and intelligent. So this is going to be another fellow hygienist, Elaine Rodriguez. Woohoo! Hello, everybody. Hi. <laughs> Thank you so hey, much for Yes, absolutely. So I know you guys are, it's summertime and you're probably out like barbecuing right now. But if you're watching, uh, tell me who you are, where you're watching from. I see viewers are coming in. Please let us know who you are and where you're watching from. So Elaine, tell us a little bit about you. So I am a clinical hygienist turned laser consultant. I am a CE provider and my specialty is training offices on laser implementation strategy and team development. So all things that encompass laser, full laser integration into the practice. I love it. And what was that, what was the journey from being a clinical hygienist to that? So starting off as clinical hygiene, I went, I worked in different practices. So I've worked in corporate dentistry. I've worked in private practice, very small mom and pop style of uh, dentistry and I've also worked in um, some pediatrics. I temped for several years so I've had a lot of different experiences working in dental offices so I always geeked out going to CEs and always had my little highlighters and I just loved it um, and I would see people up on the podium talking delivering and I just thought wow I would love to do that someday so moving forward, you know, early on, we wanted to integrate lasers into our practice. So that was right out of the gate, my first uh, private practice job. So I just took a liking to it. Um, I did well for our practice, really growing it, helping build it. And it just came into training. I found that there was a huge deficit for training and I got into that niche. So just fulfilling the, fulfilling the need. Do you think a lot of what we do today, especially as clinical pair providers, because you know there's a huge uh, change happening right now, right? Like we have had so many clinical care providers have been practicing for decades, and people are not retiring as young. But as as we are going through providing our care, we have this technology that's just incredibly uh, innovative and keeps changing the way you do things. And there are times where we want to utilize that technology. There are times that we want to leverage that technology um, and I know you said that that was something it came down to training do you find that a lot that it's just it's not really the technology but it's just a fear of using that technology that's the roadblock well yeah yeah it's the training so I a lot of doctors purchase the technology and they want you know their hygienist to just pick it up right away and use it but I'm a hygienist right so if I don't feel comfortable using that tool I'm not going to use it if I don't know how to talk to my patients about it um, I'm not going to want to feel like I'm selling it to a patient. So it's a new step. One, learning a new tool. Number two, it's learning the communication skills. And three, it's what goes into fee-for-service, you know, style of practice. So insurance doesn't contribute. So there are a lot of roadblocks, but initially it is just, hi, Rhonda. It is 
just, you know, the training. It's getting comfortable with it, getting confident with it. And yeah, so. And, you know, it's so true because um, a way for a dental hygienist or any clinical care provider, like you said, to feel comfortable with any technologies, obviously to know how to utilize it and then to know the pros, the cons and the benefits. And as a hygienist myself, I did come across that a lot too, because I remember trying to use, you know, uh, different kind of x-ray machines yeah. and not exactly always knowing, is this the right way? Is this the right thing? Because we were not taught that in school. And we'll be afraid if somebody were to ask us a question, how to reply. And because you've been doing this for some time, what are some of the ways that you've come across where it's very, um, well, not some of the ways. Let's talk. Let's 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 hype it up a little bit. What are some of the best ways that you have come across to market new technologies? So, first of all, it's just talking directly with your patients. So you want to really be the advocate, and we hear a lot of you know build value, build value, but. Really, it starts with the fundamentals of what are we doing? What do we want this laser to do? So I take it a step back and look at what is the assessment? How are we discussing disease? How are we discussing treatment? How are we comparing the traditional model with the new way of doing things? So that communication in itself is just really um, the key ingredient because I can hand you a brochure, I can t refer you to my website, um, I could refer you to, you know, periodicals, but patients don't speak science. They don't speak laser science. Um, so it really is up to us to be able to, you know, be at the forefront of explaining what this is. Number two, once we get the team comfortable, then we can start campaigning, maybe doing some, you know, office referral campaigns, um, getting people to come in, talk, to, talk about it with their family members. And then we can look at, uh, taking it to the next tier, which would be maybe creating some online marketing, social media campaigns, um, demand force blast, lighthouse blast, or whatever their patient communication uh, systems are. So there, there are many, many ways. Um, and how about you? You are the marketing guru, so I'm equally as excited to ask you, when we are incorporating new technology, what do you think is the best way? And everybody wants a shortcut. What's the best? What's the quickest? What's the fastest way? There, well, there is no quick way. But, uh, you know, if you want quick, with quick ways, you're going to get very small, inefficient results. But, you know, when it comes to technology, patients don't know technology. They don't understand technology. They did not go to dental school. They have no idea what a iTero is, what a laser is, what a CEREC is. They, you know, to them, these are just words. Um, instead of focusing on that technology and just talking about that technology by itself, I would actually take a step back and say, okay, well, what does this talking technology provide to my patients? Mm -hmm. Is it something, you know, like there is local anesthesia now, right? Which is pretty much something that you don't have to inject. There are different ways where you are not injecting things anymore. You are a needleless practice. Mm -hmm. So what are the fears? What are the problems that this dental technology is solving? Whether it is, I don't have to put that annoying fluoride in my mouth for one full minute. How do we talk about that, right? So instead of talking about the technology, I would directly recommend going into saying, hey, this is a pain, pain issue for you. This is something you do not enjoy. Guess what? We don't do that. We have a solution for that. Mm -hmm. So whether, you know, so looking at your marketing and your messaging from a point of view, where you're saying, okay, well, what is this technology providing us? What does it provide to the patients? And then talking about that as a solution. Because yeah. I, I had somebody uh, recently, Elaine, who was, you know, telling me that let's put out a newsletter about iTero. And they created this newsletter with iTero. And they're like, iTero, iTero, iTero. And I'm like, that's great. You know, it's amazing. You are, you are investing in yourself. You're doing this for your patients. But Patients don't know what an iTero is. Like, it doesn't make sense for us to sending out this newsletter um, to your entire patient base and talking about this amazing piece of technology, except we don't know what it does. So I would definitely change that up and keep your messaging as to why. What is the problem that it's solving? Yeah, yeah I agree. I agree. That's why I think that should be third tier. I think we need to work on that communication, explaining the benefits. Uh, making those comparisons from the way we used to do things to why this is the better 
you know, way of doing things now. So moving forward. Absolutely. And I see we have, hey, Rhonda, sorry, we didn't get to say hi. Hi, Rhonda. And uh, we have some viewers coming in now. Hey, guys, if you're watching, tell us who you are, where you're from. And if you have any questions, because we are going to be answering a bunch of a uh, bunch of different things today. So let's get into our dental hygiene mode now, because, you know, you are a hygienist. I'm a hygienist. How long did you practice for? So I've actually been in dentistry for, I think, 16 years, almost 16 years. So I feel like I was raised in dentistry. I started <laughs> off as a dental assistant to a prosthodontist, the denture doctor. So I was chair side working, you know, with this specialist doing full mouth extractions, immediate dentures, um, implant placement. And this was back in the day when implants were just for, you know, the affluent people who had money. So it really kind of it did something to me and I joke with, um, if you've taken my class, you hear this joke all the time that it kind of traumatized me. So it kind of forced me into wanting to get into the preventative side of things. So this is why I love laser because it's very forward. Um, it is, it falls right into your preventive models. Um, so it, it's, it's just amazing. So yeah, so that's what really kind of got me into hygiene. So I've been a clinical hygienist for eight years. And I just recently stepped out of my clinical role and I'm working my business um, full time as of October of last year. So it's oh, been a for me, just congratulations. Me. So this is something very new and something super exciting. How has the journey been so far? It's been amazing. I mean, it's we've experienced tremendous growth. So I've actually been in business since 2014. And I started okay. doing CEs, um, hosting other people doing CEs, hosting my own supplemental CEs. Um, and then it just transformed into me becoming an AGD CE provider. Because uh, I had been going into practices, consulting, just kind of under the table, if you will, just kind of helping peer to peer. And then I decided to really, you know, step it up a notch, just really take those major steps that are needed to you know, get out into the real world. <laughs> well, let's, we're going to, we're going to divert a little bit here because this is such a great topic. Um, I was just talking to somebody today and we were talking about their shift where they're feeling uncomfortable to get away from the comfort of an income coming in uh, and not mm -hmm. jumping for that new idea that they have for the, you know, to have that balanced lifestyle, which is theirs and not yeah. really a job. Um, and you did it so recently. So what are some of the tips or what, what, what did you tell yourself and said, all right, you know what? It's time. This is time. I am ready. I'm going to go ahead and launch this. What were some steps that you took to do that? Um, so I wish I could say that it was overnight. I never do anything without thinking about it and then rethinking it and then doing it again and then doubting myself and then doing it again and then going for it. So there were so it, it's been a journey, but uh, my first year in, I first scaled back. So I started working three days a week. Um, so slowly but surely, I started scaling back, doing three days a week. I started changing my, you know, spending habits, making those, you know, adjustments, right? Because you get a, you're in student mode, and then you get out of school, and then you're just kind of enjoying yourself and just kind of living differently and um, being a little bit more comfy. And then you know, you get to that point. So I scaled back from working six days a week hygiene to three days a week. So that was like my first little baby step at that. Um, and then I started prioritizing my time uh, to be able to work my business, function my business. So it does get to the point where you have to choose because when I'm, I, and I have to be really honest with myself, there were days where I was in the op, but I was not in the op. And when Ooh. I caught myself and became super self-aware of that, I was like, I can't do this anymore because when you're in the you have to give all of yourself to that patient. And that's really why we start burning out and blah, blah, blah. But we, I really had to make that decision, you know, for myself. Uh, number two, I'm a family woman. So I do have a daughter and that, you know, became a thing too. So failure was never an option. So once you commit, like I had to do it, I had to go full on. Um, but that first year working three days a week, running my business, kind of just throwing some dates on the calendar. It looked like me working till like set 6 or 7 p.m. on Thursday and then just taking the latest flight out to wherever 
um, flying in, God willing, there weren't delays and I'm in at like 3 a.m., 2 a.m., 1 a.m. to wherever, you know, Denver, um, Dallas, wherever, and just, you know, waking up on Friday and teaching a class. So, I mean, a lot of visine, right? Mm -hmm. A lot of like spritzer, a lot of water, um, <laughs> Stick, you know, like you just have your little survival tools to just get work. And it was cute at first because people are like, oh, look at her. She's so passionate. Like they didn't care. My hair was like, you know, messy and, you know, so work on your branding, right? You want to brand yourself as like the nice, you know, all put together. But really it, you know, it's not that glamorous and elegant in the beginning. So, um, it, it, it's tough, but I mean, it's totally doable. You just got to come in. You just got to come in and failure is not an option. Uh, going back to the op was not an option. You did not want to do, you did not want to get back in there. This was just something that kind of happened and this was it. This was it for you. I mean, I still, I still love clinical hygiene. I still love clinical hygiene and I still love working with clinical hygiene bosses. So with, you know, my company, I get a lot of people who are wanting to take their practice to the next level. So I get to work with a lot of uh, hygienists in leadership roles in their practice. So that really like feeds my soul. I just love working with um, hygiene teams. But, you know, I was kind of having like, like these weird identity issues because I'm like, oh my God, I'm not in the op anymore. What if I go rusty? And it, it's really not the case, but you know, I'm looking at other things. Um, it's a little, well, it's not that premature right now. I'm, I work in, or excuse me, I live in Arizona. So we have a lot of liberty here in Arizona. We can actually own our own practices here. So that's, you know, what I'm looking to going forward is getting my own practice so I can get in and kind of run things, you know, my way. Oh, that's a great idea. Yeah, fantastic. Congratulations. Hopefully next time we chat, you'll be like, hey, I just started another, you know, business. I have a, I have a practice now. <laughs> well, you mentioned, um, you know, you mentioned dental hygienists and a part of elevating them and explaining them. What about the dental hygiene culture? There's so much talk right now. It's such a trend about what is this dental hygiene culture? How do we go ahead and make ourselves better or how do we make sure that we are providing the best care we can or if you don't want to be in the in the op how do you get out of the op right so there is a lot of talk about dental hygiene culture right now and i know that that's something that you're really passionate about yeah. so tell us a little about that so there are so many different pieces to it like anytime you hear the world word culture it's a huge buzzword and it's a little piece of you know who are you what makes you special? Like what really drives you and motivates you? What do you love about hygiene? And, you know, what do you hate about it? And it's like bringing people together in a safe environment where they can kind of let their hair down, let loose, kind of have a glass of wine, a glass of tea, whatever you choose, and just really get those out in the open. So a lot of my events are, so my dental hygiene culture events are all the, it's like a little poo-poo platter of different CE topics. So we've talked about, uh, local anesthesia, we've talked about how we're using lasers in a preventative and interventive way. Um, we talk about the oral systemic link. We talk about bossing up and really creating leadership, working on your interpersonal communication skills with your team, with your assistants, with your doctor, with your patients. So it's really, you know, the communication style, the linguistics, you know, how you carry yourself, how well you're taking care of yourself. Some of my favorite um, culture events have been in yoga studios where, you know, we really just come together and figure out, okay, number one, we have to take care of our body so that we can show up, you know, our best ways um, and really just keep our, ourselves replenished. So it's really this, I kind of play off of this idea of, you know, rejuvenation. So what does the laser do? It rejuvenates, it reinvigorates the gums, it, it helps repair what the damage has caused, right, from gum disease. So this essentially is kind of playing off of that reinvigorating piece where you come in, you attend one of our culture events, you get mentorship, you have access to, you know, what's the newest, latest and greatest in research. So we're really just combining, you know, science, technology and, uh, and networking, mentorship. I love it. And you know, part of that, I think it's so important that you said is you have to show up for yourself. Yeah. So 
if you don't show up for yourself, then why would anybody else? Or, you know, what are you doing so that you can be your best? Because you're not, you're not taking care of yourself. Self-care is such an important part. And I love that you combined rejuvenation. You know, I know you talk about lasers, so rejuvenation with lasers, but you combine that with a person's health and yeah. a person's a person's lifestyle and how fun i mean i want to go to a yoga studio and do a uh, <laughs> so i wish i could say you know i'm this fitness guru but i'm i used to be a runner like bc before child i used to get up every morning and run two miles um this is like way back in the day when i was an assistant um and then it was like crossfit three times a week and then now it's like no like my cheeks are you know what i mean so you just do the best you can. And I'm on that like airport diet. So I've been meditating all day about like, I really need to make a little list for myself because you know, the jet setting life isn't cute either. You know, it really could take a toll on your body. So, um, so yeah, self care is the key. <laughs> yeah. I had a, Recent flight. So something recently happened with me. I was speaking in Pennsylvania the last couple of weeks. So I don't live in Pennsylvania. I live in Washington State. So I was across the nation. And I was speaking the last couple of weeks. And I realized that, you know, I had to drive over two hours because I was visiting some family while I was there as well. So it took a little, you know, R&R time as well, as well as doing some work. And I remember that I was going in um, these lectures and I was doing these things. And I did have that question saying, I just drove two hours. You know, you have to show up. You have to show up great. You are, if you are the speaker, you need to be in control of the room. You need to be able to answer all the questions. You need to know your material. And uh, especially if, if the meeting planner is counting on you, you know, and they always are, no matter what, there is no excuse for you not to show up. I always show up like 40 minutes early than I'm supposed to. But because I want to get there, I want to park, I want to make sure that my hair is not like crazy frizz. Yeah. Um, you know, it's tamed down and I'm okay and I'm presentable and I'm able to do that. Yeah. And so much of that is also marketing. The yeah. way you are, the way you have your image, the way you present yourself, it's all marketing. You know, it's how you communicate with people, it's all marketing. And there are a few things that I specifically have which are a no negotiation. That means that there are a few things that I just simply don't negotiate on. I don't back down on. And a part of that is, you know, I show up on time. If you're telling me to show up at 5.30, I am going to be there talking to you at 5.15 because that's, that's just, I, 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 hate, I hate being late. I hate people who come late. It's one of those things where if you don't appreciate my time, I don't appreciate your time um, kind of a situation. So. I always have that. Another thing I always have is always look presentable. And recently, I was at multiple different conferences, conferences for speakers. Hey, Amy, thanks for joining us. Hey, Birdo, thanks for being here. Uh, and uh, we had meeting planners from major, major meetings like you know Chicago Midwinter and Yankee major meetings. And they had they were talking about a few ways uh, what a speaker can do to get spots in these major conferences. And funny enough, all of them consistently were talking about image and we're talking about, uh, you know, your content is great and we love that, but we want to make it easy to work with you. So if we give you deadlines or if we tell you send us information here or do this or that, and if you don't follow that through, they're like, okay, we don't have time to keep following up or we don't have time to do that. So, and it's such a big part. There are definitely some ways where I think marketing plays so much of it and going back to laser, right? Like you can use a story like that. Everybody who's listening, dental practices who are listening. Oh, thanks Rhonda, Rhonda's making a comment here. And then the practice who are, if you're trying to market laser, market it that way. And tell to them, you know, some of the first things that people notice about you are your smiles. And especially when you have broken gums or especially when you have bleeding or you got a surgery and you don't feel your best. You don't want to, you don't want people looking at you saying, oh, what's going on there? You know, there is technology out there that's available and we use that. It's pain free. It's easier. It's better for you. It's better for us. So change your marketing to what people connect with. Um, and if that's the messaging that works, have you tried that messaging with your laser marketing? Oh yeah, absolutely. So 
you started off that story with talking about, you know, being a presenter and really mm -hmm. kind of coming into that room, commanding that room, like people are there to see you. And, you know, I we could go way deep into how to present because we have our material here, but to communicate it in a way where it's going to flow and people are going to understand it, you know, and there's so many different people in the room. There could be periodontists, there could be, you know, general doctors, there could be students in the room. Um, I mean, so you have to know the temperature of your room, right? So just as we do that, we have to know the temperature of our patients. So uh, when, so as I'm going through my trainings, I try to encourage everybody to kind of get behind the psychology of the patient. So I'm really fascinated with the, with behavior psychology and what really makes these patients accept treatment or not. And it has everything to do with us kind of being attentive to their needs. So if a patient is going to come in uh, expressing anxiety, today may not be the day that me, the go-getter hygienist, tries to get that same day treatment. Maybe there's a way that we can kind of incorporate that, not dance around the diagnosis, get right to it, create urgency, and then set them up for a future appointment. So it's everything. So laser, by the way, laser is the tool I use to do this treatment. Laser is like the last thing you hear. It's all about treatment, therapy. What is the, what are we doing here? Like, how am I giving you value? Like, because patients, especially when they're paying for something, they'll pay for nails, they'll pay for hair, they'll pay for that image, they'll come in with their Louis bags, but they are the ones that are going to decline that treatment. And I joke in class, you know, there. Are, how do we handle that declination? Because prior to training, most of us just say, okay, they don't want it today, or uh-oh, insurance doesn't cover it, so I'm not gonna offer it. We have this like weird idea about, you know, selling, you know, treatment. So really it's kind of, how are we connecting with our patients? How are we kind of reading their temperature? and really kind of feeding off of what they're expressing to me is most important to them. So there's all these different, you know, what's most important, WMI or whatever statements, but it's really, we go about it in a different way, uh, but really it is being, you know, attuned to what your patient's needs are and then building off of your rapport and the trust that you have. So it's gonna vary, it's never cookie cutter, right? Because I could be just the temp hygienist in that practice that day, or I could be you know, the lead hygienist there every single day with that patient. And that's really why I got, you know, the majority of my experience because I was one hygienist in one practice, seeing these patients four or five days a week, following up with them, you know, looking at their needs, looking at their deficits, trying to modify behavior with them. So really it is, you know, getting behind the psychology, deciding what's important, and then seeing how we can kind of tailor that in a time frame that's going to meet their needs while still, you know, meeting mine, which is, not being negligent, not, you know, dancing around the diagnosis and so on. Um, and it, it's going to change, you know, relative to your demographics, to your practice. Are we HMO? Are we, you know, in a Medicaid practice? Um, are we, you know, high-end boutique? Um, so where I am now, it's more business, you know, centric individuals. Where I was before, it was mom and pop. I might have had a mom, you know, a stay-at-home mom, or I might have had you know, an elderly patient or even a kid. So it's just, it just varies. It just varies. Yeah. So it, it's a lot of fun being able to kind of tailor your, tailor your uh, treatment plan to meet those patients needs, but at the same time, still driving it forward. Yeah. The number one rule in, uh, in marketing is know your audience. Yeah. And it's for whatever reason, it's also one of the most looked over rules. And most times when I am talking to dental practices and even just, you know, other businesses in general, and I say, hey, who do you want to attract to the practice? What are the kind of patients that you want to see? I usually get a huge range. Mm -hmm. You know, I want to see, I'm a GP, so I want to see anywhere between, you know, age two all the way to age 65, 70. I want to see everybody. But that's not your audience. That's just a general population. Who is your audience? Who is your target audience? Who is your, the go-to, you know, who is, who are the people that you want to see in your practice and knowing that audience, once you start attracting them. And then, as you said, Elaine, directing your communication to them about them. So as soon as we step out of you and you make everything about them, things just change. Yeah. 
as soon as you start saying, okay, well, how are they feeling today? Are they open to you, uh, you know, us discussing this, uh, discussing lasers or any other treatment or technology you want to discuss? Are they, how, you know, how are they reacting to what I'm saying right now? Mm -hmm. Is this a busy time for them? Is we have Mrs. Smith here, but Jimmy's running around, you know, the clinic right now, jumping around and Mrs. Smith just wants to be like, no, I just want to get out. I don't have time to do this right now. Or yeah. do you have Mrs. Smith who's like, oh, this was such a great, uh, this was such a great uh, visit today. I can't believe it. Oh, I have so many friends. They always comment about my smile, how beautiful it is. And you know, this tooth has always been bothering me. And then you get into a conversation. So very important to have that dial, right? To have that um, understanding of what a patient is feeling or what a patient is ready to do. And it's like you said, people who want to spend money will spend money. Exactly. You know, you yes. walk in with a Louis bag or a Chanel bag or you have these shoes or, I mean, even a phone, a phone is three or four digit numbers now. It's not yeah. a cheap way for to do that, right? People who want to spend money will spend money. It's all about, exactly. like you said, communicating and connecting. Yes, and I joke, you know, these patients who are declining and we're like, okay, they don't, I'm sorry, I'm sitting outside and there's a cop going by, I'm in San Antonio, and I don't know if I'm in the sketchy part of town, this is like the cutest, I always try to find the cutest, like, coffee shop that I can find, and I never know if I'm in the sketch part of town or if it's like, <laughs> the nice part um so what i joke in my classes that uh you know patients will decline and then eventually at some point we just have to move you know move it along i can't just sit here and be upset with your i'm not going to excuse you out of my chair because you're not you know immediately buying into what i'm trying to offer you or what treatment you know modality i think is best for you today uh so we move it along and they've already expressed that oh i can't have to talk to my husband or, oh, you know, not today, I don't really, you know, whatever their declination is. And then usually it's financial because insurance doesn't cover it. And then they'll go on to tell me, you know, what are you doing this summer? Oh, I'm going to Europe. And it's like, okay, like five minutes ago, you couldn't afford, you know, this laser therapy or your fluoride treatment. And now you're packing to go to Europe. So that's amazing. I can't, you know, Europe is so exciting. Happy for you, you know. <laughs> you not be judgmental and be like, you know, I'm professional here. So, you know, I just put in the notes, like patient decline treatment, patient is going to Europe. Like, you know, like you just want to. And at the same time, it's okay. Today, it's not the importance, but how can we kind of bring this into their value system? Like, how can we, you know, so then next time you want to bring it up again and blah, blah, blah. So, yeah. So you don't want to let it go. You want to let them know that this is the standard of care. And, you know, when you get back from wherever or this or how can I make this possible for you? So aside from, you know, reading their temperature, it's it's kind of following up. Like we talk about the follow up in business, but it's like, how are we following up with our patients? You know, are we, you know, attuned to them? Are we equipped to have that conversation? If I even wanted to start treatment today, do I even have, you know, the team to support? me with that because after talking to them for 30 minutes about it I know I'm gonna run behind for my next patient so we that's where the training comes in how can I start learning how to kind of work with my team because hygienists tend to be very independent creatures you know of habit we are um, so how can we really start verbalizing and connecting with our team connecting with our assistants so that we get that support uh, so I mean this is where we get like the idea of culture it's it's very very team oriented you know oh, yeah. has to talk about it. so are we and then it looks like what treatments am i providing so with laser there's over five procedures five surgical procedures that we introduce in my course it's heavy on doctor surgical as well and then we talk about you know what can the assistant do chair side to support the doctor and create that efficiency and then we look at okay with the with the hygienist depending on what type of laser you have, you could be doing over six procedures. So, you know, which procedures am I gonna do? And am I being really intentional about looking for those treatment opportunities? I love it because the whole practice has to be a part of it. It can oh, just perfect. be, yeah, it can just be one person. And that happens a lot of times when it's just the treatment coordinator who's trying to go over different things. But if you don't have the emphasis by everybody in the practice and the importance of why this is so necessary, 
because yeah. if you if as a patient if they don't understand the urgency and the necessity of it then it becomes a question mark and they say well i could do that or i could go buy myself a new purse <laughs> and i really want that new purse right so uh, how do you take over that and how do you explain the benefits the urgency um, you know the overall healthcare it's absolutely it's a complete team effort and everybody yeah. needs to be a, a part of it it can't just be there's a new technology and now the hygienist and all, only the clinical team knows even the admin team the front right. desk team they all need to be a part of this conversation and definitely. the more cohesive it is the better oh definitely so we talk about using this tribal language so if i'm using you know these terms that you know and talking the treatment up we have to make sure that the patient you know understands you know definitely and we have to make sure that the assistant can explain it in their terms and the doctor so everybody has a way of explaining things and i mean we see so many times where patients are in the chair and we're explaining to them what needs to be done and then they go to the front and they're like what what do we do again and the worst thing i mean I mean, we, this is, we're kind of digressing into a whole nother thing, but you know, so when you have a treatment coordinator that is solely responsible, and that's really one of the first things I look at when I go into training a team, who is presenting the treatment plans? Because hygienists were not, it depends on the culture of the practice. So me, I, I'll just speak for myself and there's no right or wrong. There is no right or wrong. So um, I'll speak for myself and say, when I first, you know, when I started implementing lasers in my practice, we just didn't have the manpower. We had one admin, one assistant, one doctor, one hygienist. So I very quickly had to learn how to exactly we had. No, we did not. We had a front office who was the do it all. And we know that the front, I mean, they have so much responsibility. And I think that's what kind of sets me apart, you know, in my particular niche is my background as working as an assistant and working as a floater and working as a front office and working as a treatment coordinator, I sympathize with them. I know that they have a lot on their plate. So really it's allowed me to kind of step up, learn how to, you know, do some front office administrative functions um, to be able to drive that treatment forward. So I, I know how to make my own treatment plans. I know how to reference insurance and just these little things. And granted, this is extra work. This is extra work. So I cannot be mad at a hygienist when they say, well, I'm not going to do, you know, those extras like, hey, you know, where's the money? And it's like, okay, uh, you will, you know, the more you learn, the more you earn. So then I have to kind of like be sensitive to the doctor and like the practice owner and say, okay, you have this piece of technology. It's not just learning how to wave it, use it, roll it, insert it. It's more the communication, more of like the back end functionality of how can we really implement this. So that's what implementation is. And it, I mean, there's a lot to learn, but um, you know, I love, you know, all of it comes in. So for example, I was just in New York and New York was a new territory for me and everybody's different there. And I tend to talk a little slow. So when, you know, being a presenter, you're first starting out, you just, you don't even know what you're doing. Like record yourselves, ladies and gents, if you're thinking about becoming a speaker, because um, I was doing this dental, I digress, but I was doing this dental hygiene culture day in Denver and um, I'm delivering my talk and I see I'm running out of time. I have like a hundred slides left and they're like, I heard in the back, talk faster. <laughs> I was dying. I was dying. Uh, so anyway, so I'm thinking, okay, I'm going to New York. It's the Big Apple. People are fast, fast, fast. So I'm trying to talk fast, right? Anyway, so fast forward, there was a hygienist that stayed after and she was talking to me about how her practice is in Tribeca, like downtown, busy hustle, bustle. She's like, people want in and out. Like, how am I going to do this? So again, just like you said, Manal, identifying your patient. I mean, they're obviously their key marketing was to those busy professionals, right? So then me as the hygienist, I have to morph into this, you know, practitioner who's communicating to a patient in terms and in real time that they will understand and so on. And then it's, okay, who's going to get my treatment plan for me? And then what if, you know, I'm asking my assistant to help me and she snaps at me? What if, you know, the assistant hates me, like, you know, the, all these different little, you know, cultural things in our practice. So, you know, when I go in, it, it's interesting. It's interesting going into offices, uh, the, seeing the dynamic, right? And we, you know, you know how it is. Like everybody, ha it's like a family. Everybody has their like little 
their little quirks. <laughs> but, you know, everybody has to be on board. Everybody has to support each other to, you know, take it forward. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. And the funniest part is, you know, I was in New York, New Jersey for a very long time. That's where I started. Oh, okay. And I speak too fast for them. Okay. So if they're telling you you're speaking slow, don't worry. When you speak speak fast, you're too fast. So own it. Own it. Move along. It's all good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm beyond it. I used to read. Oh, my God. I'm so beyond it. But, you know, it is true. You want to know your audience. You want to. And so I, I mean, my courses as a trainer, as a teacher, you know, and I have a great deal of respect for people in academics who teach and who give themselves in that way who can, you know, tailor a talk and a teaching, especially if it's in a two hour time frame, or eight hour time frame, it's keeping that engagement, keeping their attention, people check out, you know, patients check out like, you know, so it's, it's, it's interesting, but it's really, you know, we've created, you know, more activities, more interaction to help with the learning to really kind of drive these, you know, concepts home so that they can take these tools and resources that they just learned and really get it going on Monday. And it, it's a lot of fun. I mean, it, it's, it's something different. So yeah. I'm, still, I'm still educating, only it's not a patient sitting in the chair, it's my peers. And, you know, we talk about stage fright and, you know, freakiness. Um, it's not really about, you know, going up and, oh my gosh, I'm a, I have stage fright. It's really me knowing that people pay good money to be here. So I want to be prepared. I want to be able to give it all to you and really make sure that you have all the tools and resources that you need. So um, it's always a journey. <laughs> it is. It, it is always a journey. So, you know, the last thing we had to talk about, which we didn't get to, and we only have like a few minutes left. So which is, uh, what is the settle down or settle in? Because that was something that you wanted to discuss. And I'm fascinated by it. I mean, so with that, I when I was writing those questions in, I guess it was really me coming from, okay, First of all, first of all, I love dentistry because it really allows for that diversity. We have guy genists, we have female doctors. I mean, we have, you know, every practice I've ever worked in, uh, an Iranian doctor, my last um, bosses were uh, both Asian, uh, just so much cultural diversity in my practices. So we end up attracting, you know, those type of patients, right? So that's one thing, but uh, it's really... So, okay, we have these norms, right? These social norms, these dental norms. So we're in an industry where we as women can be speakers and we could be mothers and we could be part-time, you know, hygienists and, and providers and whatever. And, um, you know, what, when, what do we do? Because we're like pulled to it, you know? So I, I follow many different doctors, Diana Batoon, and uh, they're, everywhere they're all over the country you're all over the country and it's like are you married like you know do people ask you that are you going to settle down like when do you think you're going to stop doing this like how long can you keep this up you know this amount of travel this amount of workload uh so really it's like how do we kind of find that happy medium so that's really what i wanted to ask you you're married right i am married yes and how is your husband with you kind of traveling and you kind of working Oh, totally okay. Totally okay. Yeah, we are both very uh, independent with with our work, and we are both supporters of each other. And I, and I do get that question a lot. Uh, funny enough that you asked that, I do get a question a lot. And people a lot of times can't tell who I am or what my ethnicity is. Like, mm -hmm. I had somebody call me today, and they're like, so I'm sorry to ask you this, but are you Indian? Are you not Indian? Are you like were your ancestors Indians or, you know, what is it? So, yeah, those conversations always come up. No, you, you know, you kind of be honest with it and uh, you do what works best in your life because uh, I do believe that your personal stability uh, reflects in your work yes. at times. Uh, you know, and there's a whole different topic of all of that. But yeah. so I think the more stable and happier you are in your personal life, the more stable and happier you're going to be with your work whatever that is because you are in control of everything so that it, you know to me i just think that going out there making sure that you are on top of things and that you leave the drama where it is and uh, do your best hustle 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 you got this you know you got exactly. it well it is our time now so if anybody wants to reach out to you dear elaine how do they do that 
Uh, they can email me at Elaine at dental laser integrations.com or okay. you can uh, go to my social media accounts, dental laser integrations. Uh, my Instagram is dental laser integ and laser underscore lover is kind of my personal page, my travels, where I go, okay. uh, what I do. So that's kind of just more my personal page. Uh, but my business page is only laser in tech. Um, so go on over to my Facebook page. My number's on there. Text me. <laughs> <laughs> hey, don't do that. You don't know what you're going to get. So this is all over Facebook. But, <laughs> uh, but thank you so much for joining me today. I know everybody, summertime, people are just like hanging out outside or something. But uh, we will get back to all your comments. I know we got a few comments. If you did not get to watch the show, make sure you watch it whenever you can. It's going to be on this page. It's also going to be on YouTube and dental marketing. No, no, marketing and mocktails with Manal.com. Uh, landing page as well. There's all the shows are on that page too. So feel free, guys, to go ahead, watch it. If you have any questions, I'm sure Elaine and I will come back to you. Just tag us. We'll answer all your questions for you. And uh, we hope you have a wonderful rest of the July. I'll see you next week. Thank you. Bye, guys. Thank you for watching. Bye, guys. <laughs>